Hey, what's up? You're tuned into The Cutting Room, the show where we talk to industry-leading marketing professionals about their content marketing philosophy, process, and pregame before they edit an article live. I'm your host, Tommy Walker, and thank you so much for joining us live today. My guest today is Dan Levy. He is the Director of Content and Brand at Live Person. He was in charge of editorial strategy at Zendesk. He was the Content Director at Unbounce, which is where I met him and was one of my first major influences in the writing and thinking about the work a little bit more differently uh, than I had before. Very excited to have this conversation to catch up because it's been a little while. Uh, so I think we're gonna have a lot of fun here. So without taking any longer than we already are, Dan, tell me about your content marketing philosophy and how has it evolved over time? Well, it's definitely evolved. And in some ways I think it's come full circle. So you know, I started content marketing I would argue at, at the beginning of, of content marketing, or at least at the, at the beginning of people calling it that. Um, so 2008, 2009, I graduated journalism school, did a master's degree, worked a little bit as a reporter in DC. Um, and then, you know, through a series of circumstances, found myself in a big WPP agency that had been doing this for a long time, but they called it custom publishing. Um, and so they were producing glossy magazines for luxury brands like Air Canada, Fairmont Hotels and Mercedes, um, and they were kind of looking to, you know, figure out how to pivot and embrace the, the new digital age. Twitter was new. Social media was the hot thing. BuzzFeed was new. Um, and so I, I kind of came in and, and really applied, you know, an editorial approach to, to content marketing, having just come from journalism school. Um, and to me, that kind of boils down to three things. Uh, number one is, uh, editing really, really strong editing. Uh, number two is strong reporting. Um, and number three is excellent storytelling. Um, and so, uh, I, I could delve into those things a little bit further, but, um, just to sort of fast forward a little bit, um, ended up, as you said, at Unbounce where, where we first met, um, Unbounce was of course, marketing to marketers really early in the modern you know, conversion rate optimization space, um, SaaS marketing space. Um, and that's kind of where I learned how to be a marketer. So um, things like CTAs and, you know, CRO and landing page optimization, conversion copywriting, and I added those arrows to my quiver. Um, and then from there, I uh, was at a, a startup called Smooch that was um, selling to the enterprise. We had an early, very technical uh, API based messaging platform that connected any piece of software to all the messaging channels that were emerging at that time. Um, and that's where I sort of learned, you know, your kind of enterprise, uh, marketing playbook, uh, took on PR, uh, took on brand more broadly, uh, a lot of industry reports. We had an early industry newsletter. Um, and then that takes me to where, and, and then, yeah, as you mentioned, Smooch ended up being acquired by Zendesk. Um, so at Zendesk now, you know, I was part of this big company. Uh, learned that a lot of things that I was doing day to day uh, lived in literally multiple different departments within Zendesk. Um, and so, you know, content and copywriting and brand and um, these, these things all lived in, in literally separate, not just separate teams, but separate departments. Uh, and so I kind of carved out a special projects role for myself there. Um, and one of those special projects was working closely with product marketing. Um, and making sure that our high level of messaging and positioning was translating into the content that we were producing across a number of channels, including SEO, including campaigns. Um, and I think that's where I realized just how important that high level story is. I call it strategic storytelling. So it boils down to really helping companies working closely with leadership in figuring out and finding that story, um, crafting that story, and then going a level further and helping, you know, my team, but teams across the organization tell that story in a consistent way. Um, and so when you kind of take a step back, yes, you know, I learned a ton and about demand gen and conversion rate optimization and, you know, traditional comms. Uh, but it really boils down to those three things, you know, really strong reporting. Um, in the case of, of marketing, we're not just talking about external reporting like a journalist would do, but you really have to become a reporter in, in your own organization, right? I, I like to say content people should be the best informed people within their, within their org. So flexing those internal and external reporting skills 
editing. So, you know, you wrote beautifully on LinkedIn about this the other day, but, you know, editing, not just being about line edits, but about helping people, writers uh, think really deeply and differently um, about and strategically about the, the content that they're creating. Uh, and then storytelling, bringing it all together in a really compelling, differentiated narrative. All right. So this is the question because I've uh, been on content teams that have sat in many different areas. And one of the questions we asked in the poll here too was, uh, where do you think content marketing should sit? So our audience, I think this is pretty cool, says as its own standalone thing, rather than the brand team or the SEO team, I've sat on both sides, both brand, global brand, SEO in a number of different areas. Um, and nobody can seem to figure it out from an organizational perspective, like where does content sit? Yeah. Uh, and the reason I ask this, right, where does content sit within the organization is because you are the storyteller, you are telling the story of the company and as a content marketing team in particular, yeah. uh, you are often the most frequently published arm of the company. So there's a lot of collaboration there, or there should be a lot of collaboration there uh, to make that happen. So where does content marketing sit within the org? Yeah. So I have an opinion. I also have a kind of a cop, cop out answer, <laughs> which it, you know, which is, it depends, but, but more than that, uh, but, but it, it depends, it depends. Um, but like, I, I'm more concerned about the, the skill sets, um, and the, the role content plays within the organization than where it sits by that, but you know, by that, I mean, I firmly believe content needs to have a seat at the table when it comes to crafting that high level strategic story. Now, so, so this is where it depends, wherever they're best positioned to do that, that's where they should sit. Uh, I love that answer that of your audience, like a standalone function, you know, reporting into the CMO or, or whatnot, like, yes, you know, that, that, that positions you really well for that. Um, but, you know, I've been in some organizations where the sort of center and different marketing teams have different centers of gravity. I don't know if you've, you've, you've experienced this, right? Um, so I've been in places, um, Zendesk is a good example where the product marketing team is very much the center of gravity of the marketing team. Um, right. And in other places, it might be more of a campaigns or integrative marketing function. Um, I've been in places where actually where the brand team was that. Um, and I, so I currently, you know, sit on the brand team right now. And I, I will say that every piece of content that flows through the organization comes through our team. Um, and, you know, we very much are involved in crafting that, that strategic story. Um, but you know, if, 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 if you're better positioned within product marketing, within brand, uh, within, within campaigns, within SEO to do that SEO, probably too tactical, but SEO, but you know, SEO, if, if that's part of an integrated marketing function or a demand gen function, um, that can make sense as well. So, um, so yeah, I guess the short answer is I agree with your audience and the cop-out answer is it depends. It depends. It depends. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, that's, I mean, we, we have to always go with it depends. What, what I've, what I've seen, uh, work really well is when, and this is very rare that I've ever seen this happen. It was like, like a very, very short period of time. in one of my consulting engagements is that it was actually decentralized. Mm. Um, and the way that I, what I mean by that is the content team, content team kind of came together like the Avengers where everybody was very focused on their own disciplines in the day to day. Yep. But there was, a, it was a collaborative thing where they were working together in, in a few different ways. And I thought it was great because you have a lot of information exchange that's happening between everybody, but they're also sort of going, if you will, to their own standalone movies at the end of the day and producing stuff that, you know, there's, there's a lot of back and forth. So it was almost this like sideways reporting where everybody went into an editor, but yeah. at the end of the day, we're all sitting in different areas, which I thought that was a really interesting structure. And that maps well to like that idea of, of content folks as almost like embedded reporters, right? Embedded into their functions, embedded into different parts of the organization. So I definitely see the benefits of that. Um, during the last year or so of my tenure at, at Unbounce, we tried something similar where we actually split the whole marketing team into squads dedicated to different parts of the customer journey. And we had content writers um, and strategists embedded into each of those squads. And then we did come together like the adventures, what we call the content chapter. Um, and there we were really able to focus on, on quality control, um, which was great. Uh, the downsides of that, of course, were, you know, 
you know, some confusion or mixed signals about like, well, who am I actually reporting into my squad lead or the chapter lead who's responsible for, you know, so they it, it, you risk having that push and pull between call it quality and, uh, out, or, and results, which I don't think by the way, it needs to be attention. Uh, but you risk that happening when you set things up like that. And you, you run the risk too. I, and I don't think there's ever, there's, I don't think there's ever really a good question, right? It goes back to that depends, but it's also like, or a good answer to the question because it does depend by doing the pod and squad, you know, model, right? Yeah. Cause we've yeah. talked to, um, Margaret Jones from Airtable about this a little while ago, cause she's huge on production. Her whole philosophy sort of revolves around the production of things and how that works is the pod and squad model kind of makes it so you have your own micro silos mm. within a, an organization that can be traditionally siloed off from the rest of the company anyways. Um, Sabrina, right. I'd love to get your take on this uh, as you're watching along because I know that you've got some experience in this area as well. So what does that look like for you? Um, now, now, when we're looking at strategic storytelling, right, we can talk about where content sits in the, in the world of uh, the, the organization, but the end result of that, yep. right, is yep. about telling better stories. And I'd like to bring that back into the philosophy question, yep. which yep. is when you're thinking about the stories that you're telling from that bigger perspective, right? What does that look like for you? Because I know that a lot of us, you know, a lot of the audience here, I know I've, my, my experience, your experience has always been in B2B content marketing. Um, I think the, the, the humanistic element of that is starting to shift a little bit more. We're starting to realize that it's people on the other side. Yeah. Yeah. But that's not always the case. Can you tell me a little bit about like your influences in that area where your sort of mind wraps around that and... Uh, yeah, just how that all sort of merges together for you. Yeah, so in, in terms of that, you know, B2B versus B2C question, um, you know, there, there are new nuances, of course. Um, I actually started my career in, in B2C, so that agency that I worked for, you know, was, was targeted or, you know, was working with like consumer brands, airlines, hotels, that type of thing. Um, and then of course, you know, as a journalist, well, you, you sort of write for both B2B and B2C audiences, right? Um, so to me, like, it's never been a really fine line, um, because as you said, you are marketing to humans. Um, and I think you could actually really use that, um, to your advantage. Um, and that's actually part of the reporting process is just really understanding what these humans, even in B2B roles, what, like, what's their, what's their day to day? Right? What are their pains? And I'm not just talking about pains that map to product and jobs to be done. Yes, that's all important. But like, what are like what keeps them up at night? What are they worried about in their own careers? Right? Something that that we've seen at Live Person is just the impact that using our technology has had on people's careers and in growing their own careers and growing teams and you know going from you know a, a manager to or you know an individual contributor, maybe even a customer support agent to a manager to sort of a team lead and up into the C-suite even. So I think understanding the like, even the human side of B2B marketing, um, even the, the, the irrational stuff, right? That's not necessarily just about driving results because like, you know, if, if marketing was just about like talking about co like benefits, like every single one will, be will boil down to save costs or increase revenue, right? Like I, I, I'll, do your, I'll do your personas right now, right? Like ultimately people want to save costs or they want to increase revenue. So I think understanding the nuances of that on a human level is really important. Um, the, the other side of that is that even if you're um, marketing to a B2B audience, um, those Bs have Cs, right? <laughs> those, those, those businesses have their own customers. Um, so you need to be thinking about your customers' customers and the end um, experience that you are enabling. Again, th speaking through the lens of a software company here. Um, which is, uh, you know, lot, lot, much of my experience in the last decade or so. Um, and so, you know, I think B2B companies will do themselves a great service if they, number one, take inspiration from B2C marketing and, and kind of get out of the playbook, um, but also keep their end users in mind, keep the, the, the C's in mind, um, and also thinking about their B's as C's, right? Because we're all, we we're, we're all have our business hats on and we're consumers and, they're not really hats, especially when we're working from home, you know, 
uh, you know, like like we are right now, um, those lines actually are very, very blurry. So yeah, that's sort of my take there. That's interesting. Like when when I had created my first content code for Shopify, one of the rules that we had uh, in place was it was something along the lines of consider the stakes, right? Yeah. And it's not necessarily about, you know, we, we kind of say solve the customer's problem, solve the customer's problem, solve the reader's problem. But there's a layer deeper to that. And I think this is pretty much what you're saying, where it's like the stakes of this person not solving the problem. And it does get a little bit more personal. Maybe they are on the right. And I'm going to get real personal. Maybe they're on the outs with their wife and their career is right about to implode. And mm -hmm. there's like mm -hmm. there's a lot of things that are happening where if this person doesn't solve this problem yep. and if they yep. don't solve it now, they could actually be on the brink of collapse or they might be looking for a promotion, right? One of the things I like to think about is content is a form of social currency. Yep. So yep. if you're sharing this stuff, if you can give them something that shares that makes them look smart, maybe that's going to help them climb the ladder because exactly. that's exactly. something that they want to do. And it's not just a matter of going like, you know, how do we solve this immediate problem of how to, I don't know, implement a landing page, right? Or how landing pages can help you boost conversions or make more revenue, right? I'm just going to landing pages because that's where <laughs> our background <laughs> is together. But yeah, yeah, it's it's not just about that, right? There's a reason why somebody's searching for that, and it's not just as matter of do 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 do. I want to increase more revenue. It's like in some cases, it's like do 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 do. We're gonna go under if we don't increase our revenue. Um, that's right. You know. That's right. Or we, our budget just got cut. So now we have to think about, you know, da, da, da. So that's a lot of, I, I think if I'm taking away properly, that sounds like part of what you're saying, where it's not just the stakes of what's immediately and on the table. It's much, much bigger than that, or it can be much bigger than that. That's right. It's not just the jobs to be done. It's the, the state of mind and the frame of mind um, that, that, that people are in when they do those jobs and that motivate them to get those jobs done. Yeah. Yeah. And those could be very personal and very nuanced, uh, to your point. Well, let's, let's, um, let's talk a little bit about, uh, a process because there is a way that you get to that information. It doesn't just happen, right? Mm -hmm. How do you get to that information that then informs the content, content that you're creating? And then yeah. the sub point, maybe we can weave into this as naturally as possible. What role is AI playing in this for you? Sure. Yeah. Um, so, so again, going back to the kind of tenets, not the tenets of journalism, but what, what journalists do and what good journalists do, um, that reporting piece, right? That, that comes first. So you really want to, you know, embed yourself within the, within the organization. Um, that, that's a lot of relationship building. Um, that's a lot of conversations early on in your tenure, but, but throughout your tenure, making sure you're connected to the sales organization and sales leadership. Um, making sure you have a good relationship with, you know, with the CEO and other, you know, executive team leaders, um, making sure that you're actively participating in, in Slack or wherever those sort of conversations and water cooler, uh, wherever that lives within your, within your, your company, making sure that you're participating. Um, you're not just lurking, but you're participating, that you're sharing information. Um, because I think that there's a culture, um, content marketers thrive off of context. Right. If we don't have the context that we need to do, our, like, then we, we can't write the content. Um, and that's part of why I've come to this idea of strategic storytelling that, like, we can't just rely on that context to flow through to us. We have to help build it. Right. We have to help build the story. And in that story, as, as um, uh, Andy Raskin likes to say, story is the strategy and the strategy is the story. Right. Um, so we have a role in shaping that. Um, but of course, we don't do that on our own. That needs to be informed by leadership, by customer research, um, you know, building again, relationships with customers early on, so important. Um, and again, not just in the context of product research or either even in customer stories, just building relationships to really understand, you know, their day to day, what it is that they're concerned about, what is it that drives them? Um, so customers, incredibly important input, um, you know, leadership, uh, staying on top of, of, of trends, right? In, in the world, in the market, um, competitive intelligence, all, all this good stuff. Um, that's sort of the, those are the inputs. Um, and then in terms of process, um, I, I think it's really important to have a container to, um, to meet as content creators, to 
both brainstorm and pitch ideas to each other. Um, so I think the pitch meeting, again, it's, it's, it's kind of old school, um, but it's often missed in the process. Um, and, and, and to be clear, like brainstorming and pitching aren't the same thing, right? They're both important. Brainstorming is generating ideas and building off each other, and, and that's all important. But um, I think building the muscle of pitching is, is, is even more important because that's where you're, you start to shape the story, right? Um, and that's where you, you sort of test it, right? You, you, you kind of like stress test it against each other um, and, against, and against the pitch itself to say, like, does this even make sense when you, when you put it into writing? So, um, so yeah, I would say the reporting, the editorial meetings um, and uh, are, are just two pivotal parts of that process. And then of course the storytelling is the third, that, that third piece there, um, which uh, you know, is where the magic happens to happen. Yeah. When, um, when I was at QuickBooks in particular, I feel like I, I kind of perfect, I, I don't want to say perfected, but no, I perfected <laughs> the art of the brainstorm versus the pitch. And the idea of the brainstorm was always, you know, it wasn't, there are no bad ideas, right? Because we want people to come to the meeting with refined ideas, yeah. but yeah. we thought about it in terms of green zone and red zone. And in the green zone, we cannot say things like, oh, that won't work because, right? Or I don't know about that. No, we had to create an environment where it was safe for somebody to throw out an idea. And what would happen is, naturally speaking, um, as the ideas got exciting for people, right? When we took it over to the red zone, we had these things that were starting to become a little bit more refined right. in the way that they were, you know, we really applied pressure to some of these ideas until the point it was like, okay, now let's, now that we have these core ideas, let's get into the pitch. So That's I really it. like what you're saying there because uh, a lot of times um, it can just be like, hey, we got to fill the calendar, right? And that becomes, that, that just ends up, you just end up in this really redundant spot and yeah, hey, back to school is coming up. What can we do around that? And hey, Black Friday, like you know, like um, yeah, it gets it gets really really obvious and really boring. Um, another thing to consider is, do you need or want to have the same people in the brainstorm as you do in the pitch? Right. Um, I would argue that for the brainstorm, you actually want to cast a much larger net. Um, you want representatives from around the organization, um, people who are frontline with customers, people in the sales org, people from the product team. Right? You, you want to curate, you want to make sure you have creative, generative people. Um, but um, they're, they're, you know, that, that's like almost like a council, right? Um, that you're sort of moderating and, and, and using to sort of pull ideas out of. Um, the pitch meeting is for the, the professionals, the content professionals, right? Because um, that's a real skill building a pitch. You don't, you're not going to ask your CPO to like, you know, write a pitch and, you know, like, because, because you're going to end up tearing that person apart, right? In right. the relationship because they don't know how to do that. They're like, um, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, exactly. So don't even go there. Um, so I think, you know, separating those two spaces, but also curating the people in them a little bit differently is also an important part of the process. Now with the pitch itself, right? I, and I, I just want to get some clarification around this because I think there's, and by the way, this is like one of my, I, I've, I, we talk about process a lot on the show. This is like really super interesting to me. Um, when you're talking about the pitch, are you just pitching to editorial or are you also pitching to the people who were part of the broader mm -hmm. org? Because it sounds like it could go, I mean, that sounds like the natural progression to me where it's like, hey, was this really, is this a refined idea of what we were talking about in the brainstorm? Yeah, good, good question. Um, I would say that this, the pitch is on the editorial level. Um, it should already be informed by conversations that happened on the broader organizational level. Right. So, so for example, you know, quarterly planning, um, uh, campaigns, um, upcoming product launches, right. You should have already aligned, um, at a marketing leadership level on what are the priorities and, and what, and then, uh, you know, I, am a big believer in empowering the, the, the editorial team to actually figure out the best way to, you know, um, enact, you know, tell those stories, right. Um, that, that fit into those, whether it's a campaign or, or product launch or whatnot. So, um, you know, uh, I think yeah, the pitch is, is really where, where the editorial team gets to shine. Gotcha. Okay, cool. That makes, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, okay. So Sabrina said from a little bit earlier, I really appreciate the point to think about the customers of your customers with B2B companies. Uh, I write for a lot of the problems of the customers affect the business itself. 
yeah, I mean, I think that there's, we, we, we don't, we don't often think about that. We're, in, in my mind, we become sort of, I don't want to say myopic because that's not the case. It's, it's focused on one layer deep though. It's, it's, we're looking at the one layer and not the second layer of what happens when they solve this problem. Why are they yeah. trying to solve this problem? Because it's not that's just when, immediate. That's when the story becomes interesting, right? And that's when the story becomes human. Um, and Unbounce actually um, did a case study once. Um, uh, and, and the case study focused on an agency that was using us. So they were the, they were the business. They were the B, right? Um, but they worked with, um, in this case, I think it was a New Balance franchise in Chicago. Um, and they had, they had optimized their landing pages for, I, I forget the exact use case, but it was a very specific thing on a very local level, really well-known brand, but on a really local level, um, this is this family run franchise. And we didn't just talk to the agency. We actually talked to the New Balance franchisee. So you don't just have to, so Sabrina, like, you know, th thanks and, and great point, but you don't just have to talk to your, uh, you don't have to think about your customers' customers. You can actually talk to them too, right? You can actually ask for introductions to them um, and interview them and read that into the story. And it makes it so much more real. That's the first time I've ever heard that, and I really like that. I like that a lot because it gives, it gives so much more perspective to the entire thing. I, here, here would be the like inception level thing. What yeah. if you talk to yeah. your customers, 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 right? <laughs> right, right. You, you, you could go, go a little too that, far with it, but you go outside that store, like you know, streeter style, and, and interview the, the folks coming into the door. Yeah, hey, yeah, I like it. And now, now you've talked to everybody. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right, I'm a janitor. <laughs> all right, so we're gonna we're gonna get into the pregame part now. So you've gotten the, uh, you've gone gone from the brainstorm. You've gotten the pitches. Uh, we'll say that things have been created and they are created in a way that really resonates, right? Yeah. Um, and we could talk about like ideation, the publication, and da, da, da. we're going to flash forward just a little bit. Yeah. Now you've yeah. got the thing in front of you. You've got the product. What are you doing before you edit? And what I mean by this is sort of, you know, we could talk about what you do while you edit and what you're looking for. But what is really always fascinating to me is like the little rituals that you might have before you sit down to do the work. Oh, that's a, on a personal level or on a yeah. like team level. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, either yeah. way. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I'm sick right now, so I've got a cup of tea. Often it's a cup of coffee. Um, you know, uh, I actually like, I realized that I think best in motion. I don't know if I'm alone in this, but like I've started going for walks um, and actually um, maybe not so much when I'm editing, but when I'm writing, I'll end up writing like, the intro and the first paragraph or two in my head as I'm moving around and as I'm walking around the block. I do a lot of my writing out, like away from the computer. Um, that's right, in the shower, um, just sort of, you know, moodling on it. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, I guess that, that's sort of part of the ritual is to get away from the computer, get some distance from it. Um, and then, you know, and it also helps with that blank page problem, right? Because I know exactly when I come back, often I've already picked it out on my iPhone and emailed it to myself or whatever. Um, so, I, so I already have those first couple paragraphs. Um, I think this is probably a segue to talk about AI. <laughs> I know that, you know, it's top of mind for people. Um, you know, I, I do think, um, you know, with the, that question of where AI fits into the editorial process and the content marketing process is, um, you know, not just kind of a hot topic, but a really important and interesting one. Um, I, I know I'll start off there by just saying that I think, I fundamentally think on a human level that AI is only important and useful and valuable insofar as it, you know, furthers human achievements and empowers humans to focus on the things that really matter. Right. Um, and that, that's sort of like a, just a, on a philosophical level, I think if you're not thinking about it that way, um, not just are you thinking about it the wrong way, but you're kind of on the wrong side of history. <laughs> So, yeah. <laughs> so that, that's sort of my preamble to that. Um, the good news is I actually think that this technology is really well suited to, to that purpose. Um, and where, it, and, you know, it's funny, I, I recently joined uh, a company that, you know, has a, a large AI component to it. Um, and, you know, one of the first questions I was asked was like, you know, how are we going to um, use AI in, in our marketing and in our, in our content production process? 
And actually where my head went first was like, you know, let's use it for the stuff that is almost the like eat your vegetables side of content marketing, right? At least for me, not for everybody, but like the SEO content that, you know, maybe is not the sexiest, it's not your best thought leadership content, but you need to rank for this term, um, uh, you know, or, you know, generating multiple um, headlines for AdWords or, or LinkedIn ad copy, right? Um, and so that's where, um, that's where we're sort of starting to experiment with AI as, as part of that process. Um, you know, the one great thing about SEO content is like, you're, you're already, you know, arguably you're already writing for machines. So why don't you use machines to help you write that? Um, of, of course, you know, ultimately you're still writing for humans, but there is a, there is a formula to it. Um, and, and so we're, you know, again, we're starting to experiment with how you use, um, generative AI tools for everything from keyword research to, um, outlines to getting you that first draft. Um, now, the reason I break it down that way is because we think it's super important to have a human in the loop at each of those touch points. Um, that's our approach. Um, you can, in theory, and, and um, automate this at, the, at this point from end to end and even press and have it press publish and get, feed into your WordPress and, and, and go. Nobody wants that, right? Um, so, you know, I think thinking about how you strategically place humans, writers, um, thinkers um, into that process, you know, to, you know, at the, at the keyword research stage, at the outline stage, at the draft stage, and at the publishing stage, um, I think is, is really important and, and just something new, obviously, for the space. Um, so that's how I, I guess, that's how I think about um, AI. It's like, what, what, you know, how can we use AI to do the parts of content marketing and it's different for everyone, right? The parts that don't resonate with us personally, the parts that feel a little bit like, you know, the work um, and not, not, not the fun part of work um, so that we could focus on, you know, the, the stuff that I still believe only humans can do. Um, and again, I come back to, you know, reporting, editing and storytelling, right? Um, you, you, you know, no large language models are based of course on, existing content, existing conversations, existing language that's out there. Um, they can't go and generate, you know, interview your customers or interview your customers, customers and your customers, customers, customers. Right. Um, and in terms of the, the crafting of the story, um, maybe it'll get there, but you know, it's certainly AI certainly isn't, it isn't there yet. I think what's what where where I've been with AI and I, you know, I've had quite a few people now ask me like, where, where do you sit with it? Where do you sit with it? And um, what I've found is that when you understand the technique of the work, when you, when you deeply understand the techniques, then you can start to um, use it a little bit uh, more razor-like, if you will. Mm. So for me, it's like editing is broken down into what? The four different steps. So you've got developmental editing, content editing, uh, you can go to proofing and grammar, like all of that, right? And one of my most commonly used prompts right now is, here's the article, tell me it's five strengths, five weaknesses and recommendations on how to, you know, how to fix, right? Yeah, what is yeah. missing from this piece? Because we can start to look at the developmental edit from that and it has way more information than I ever will on the subject, right? So, so that's one of those things where I'm like, okay, what, what are the gaps right before I even do anything? What are the gaps? Um, and then from there, like it will always have perfect grammar. It can edit for word economy quite well. Like there's, there's all of that additional stuff, but it's like, I'm not replaced. I can't replace myself because there are still things that I want to see, but there are definitely because I know the technique. That's right. Yeah. It, it yeah, it's actually a forcing function to get more strategic and more deliberate about each stage of the process, right? You can't sort of just wing it anymore. Um, you have to really think because prompts, they kind of force you to some degree to think like a coder. They, they, they're, for, they're forcing writers to think like coders and coders to think like writers. It's really interesting, right? Um, because now, you know, technical people are realizing how important language is uh, in the crafting of the, the prompt. And in, you know, editorial people are, are realizing how important that sort of process is and the, the sort of technical aspect of the prompt. One of the reasons I'm fascinated by AI, one of the reasons I joined, you know, an AI company is just because it's, 
It's this real kind of like interdisciplinary humanistic space counterintuitively. Um, and that's always been my jam. Like I, I just love, you know, when all these different functions and disciplines and ideas and patterns are sort of thrown together to, to find, you know, find the story in them. You've just made me think that because we do have to move on to the next half of the show, but mm -hmm. you've just made me think that uh, I should probably have an AI roundtable with some of the people I think are doing AI and content very well together. I would love to know what the audience thinks about that and see if we can, we can do something cool around that. Um, all right, so we are going to move on to the mid-roll. Uh, here is going to be a quick, brief introduction to uh, Ahrefs Webmaster Tools. Really cool stuff. Highly check it out. Again, free to download, and you get a lot of power out of this. So we're going to do that, and we will see you soon. While we wait for the edit, let me tell you a little bit about Ahrefs Webmaster Tools. Now, when I started the content studio, Ahrefs was the first tool that I bought, and this will give you a taste of why. There are two parts to Ahrefs Webmaster Tools, Site Audit and Site Explorer. Site Audit scans up to 5,000 pages per month and searches for over 100 predefined issues that could hurt your site's rankings. Once the audit's finished, you'll see your website's health score, a breakdown of the top issues, and how many URLs are affected. And if you need a refresher on what these issues are, they make it easy to see what it is and tell you how to fix it. To see which pages are affected by an issue, click on the number beside it, and you'll get a full list of URLs which you can then export and fix. They even made it easy to look at each category of issue with these super handy links in the sidebar. So if you want to see on-page issues, click over here, and now you've got a nice summarized report of things like word counts, title tags, and meta descriptions. You can also click on the Issues tab to see a list of issues labeled by importance so you can prioritize appropriately. The second part of Webmaster Tools is Site Explorer, which gives you a look into your backlink and search traffic data. Starting on Site Explorer's overview page, you can see top-level metrics for your website like domain rating, total backlinks, total referring domains, and the number of keywords your site ranks for, and your estimated search traffic. And right below that is an interactive graph that shows you how fast you're acquiring backlinks from unique websites, which is a good indicator of your site's popularity. In this report, you'll see useful things like the website and page authority metrics of the linking page and the number of referring domains it has, the estimated search traffic to that page, and the context of the link, which is all super convenient. You can also use these handy filters to really drill in on the data you want to see. There's also the organic keywords report, which shows you all the keywords your website ranks for. You'll also see keyword metrics like search volume, keyword, and difficulty score. You can also see the top content on your site based on their popularity on these social networks. This only scratches the surface of what Webmaster Tools is capable of doing, and you can do this absolutely free. All you have to do is go to ahrefs.com forward slash AWT and verify your site within just a few clicks. All right, let's jump back into the edit. And we're back. Thank you so much for checking out the Ahrefs Webmaster Tools. Uh, we're going to get straight into the piece. This piece is called The Ultimate Guide to Writing Irresistible Headlines. It's an older piece. It's been around for a little while, but I think it's done an okay job at communicating how to write better sub subheads. I've, I've referenced it before in the past. But Dan, I'd love to get your first impression of the piece before we get into it. Yeah, um, so I think it's a good piece. Um, lots of really good information, lots of good advice in there, like writerly advice. Um, I think it suffers in a couple areas. Number one is the tone. Um, I had a really hard time with the tone. Um, we can get into that a little bit more when we get into the piece. Um, but I found it a little bit off-putting. And I think if I found it off-putting, then, you know, many others will as well. Um, and and the second thing is, I just, and it's sort of, you know, you, you always want, end up being a little bit more harsh when it's like a, a piece about writing. Um, but I feel like it's, it's um, it, could, it could really stand to be a lot more concise. Um, there's a lot of kind of filler in there, there's a lot of repetition, um, jargon. Uh, that's that's really clouding um, the the really good and and helpful and useful aspects of it. That's my that's my overall impression. All right, and uh, our friends in the chat, it should be showing up in the chat if you want to take a look at it. 
If not, it will be made available in the replay and also in the vault. So um, we'll make sure that you get access to this if you aren't able to access it right now. So let's talk about the first comment here right out of the gate. You know you're in a war, right? <laughs> this, this business of, of, of war uh, right off the bat, um, that, that kind of put me on the defensive right away um, and, and provoked really strong emotions. And I'm not really sure are the right emotions um, at least not that, or that early in the piece. Um, the other, the other thing, and this is sort of a recurring thing throughout the piece, uses these militaristic metaphors, war, bloody battle, uh, even like supercharged ninja. Um, and, and I just wonder from a, like a diversity, equity, inclusion, and inclusion perspective, uh, you know, how many people you're sort of turning off with that, with that sort of language. So I would recommend writing it. There's some great tools online. I can't think of any off the top of my head. Um, but great tools that sort of um, look at your content uh, and, and find words that, that stick out um, as being like not, not inclusive um, or, or just jargon in general. Um, and I think this piece could stand to, to go through one of those. All right. So from a developmental edit standpoint, right, because this is one where you are using powerful language here. Uh, it does evoke some sort of emotion and it might be a little divisive. Right. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Right. No. Where would you, if this were your piece and you didn't necessarily give that as part of the direction, what would you say to help get that back on track? Because the, the writer might feel like they're doing something really right here by, by yeah. using the strong you know, imagery invoking language. But at the same time, how would you guide that in this introduction in particular? Yeah, I, I think I would, I would encourage the writer to look for a different way in. Right. Like this was this was obviously their their way into the story. This was their angle. Um, and maybe maybe it was really useful in, in getting, you know, attacking that blank page. Um, but to me, this is one of these in, in attacking. See, another, you know, a great, a militaristic metaphor. It get, that's the thing. It got me into this mode where, like, I feel like even my feedback was more harsh than usual because it was like, OK, war, battle. Um, so, you know, if, if that's what you're going for, you know, if you're trying to just sort of make your, your readers a little bit angry and, and maybe um, alienate a, a subsection of them, then fine, you do you. Um, but in this case, um, I would say like, why don't you try one or two other just entry points into the piece? Because it really, it doesn't change the, the value of the piece. It doesn't, it, you know, it's, it's a development, like it's, it's it, I don't think it'll take them that much more work um, to sort of think about different ways and maybe start with a, a personal anecdote. Um, I'm sure there's lots of, you know, different frameworks out there for, for like how you lead into a piece. Um, but I would just try something different. Um, and, and I would also just get to the, the sort of points uh, more quickly, right? It, it's a really long intro before I sort of get to the nub of it, which is, you know, subheads and why they're so important. Like, I think, I think there's a lot of value in the content itself um, that all this imagery just sort of detracts from that. It's not necessary in this case. Yeah. And I think something like subheads, this is an interesting thing because I think there is a pretty good potential opportunity to rank because it is a very, uh, this is a very problem oriented yeah. piece, right? I've personally Googled um, how to write better subheads, especially on those times where I'm like, I can't get it today, right? I just don't have it. Um, yeah. This so, is before chat GPT. I'm yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but the but the the thing is is like it's also this is your first introduction to your brand right mm, if if yeah. this is if you're thinking about this in the terms of this is going to be someone's first introduction to me as the brand or to our brand is this the first impression that we're going to want to make and this is like the first millisecond that they might be looking at this so um that's right. And the piece even goes on to talk about turning your readers into like, you know, fans and long term you know, yeah. readers and subscribers. Like it's, it's not a friendly approach, mm -hmm. right? If that's what if that's what they're going for here. Yeah. All right. Cool. So you did a few line edits here, which is awesome. Um, <laughs> Deliver beautifully <laughs> is delivers beautifully a thing. Right. <laughs> uh, so you spent hours writing and rewriting stellar content and that delivers and reads beautifully. Yeah. OK, so. Tell me about your, like, we don't need to go into every single line edit, but tell me about your sort of thought process when you are doing your line edits and cutting some stuff out, because uh, I yeah. know that it can be, be very easy to get carried away. I, I personally get very carried away in everything. 
Yeah, yeah, same here. Um, I think it depends also on on who you're working with. Um, I, I I try to like build uh, really good relationships with the writers I work with. I mean, Tommy, that's how we know each other, right? Like it was an editor writer relationship and we got to know each other that way. Um, I don't know if you even remember what it was like, you know, me editing you, uh, if I kind of came on harshly and I was like, oh, this guy's intense or not, or I built up to that over time. Um, but, um, you know, to some degree, I think, um, I see editing as honoring the writing actually. Um, and, um, and so, I, and I tell this to, to especially folks on my team when I first, you know, start working with them, I'm like, look, I'm, I'm going to edit your stuff and I'm going to edit it. Like I'm going to be hands-on with my edits. Um, and it's not because the piece isn't good. In fact, the better the piece is just the more substantive, um, the edits will be, um, cause I'm going to want to take it from a, you know, a nine to a 10 rather than a three to a seven or whatever. Like I, I, I prefer starting with a draft that's more polished, but it doesn't mean that I'm going to have fewer edits. So, um, so anyway, so what I'm editing, so in a, in a way to answer your question, like, I think when editing a piece for the first time, in a way I'm like establishing the relationship, um, and setting the standard for what I'm looking for. Um, and then, you know, but trying to do it in, you know, as diplomatic a way as possible and, and gentle way as possible. I also don't always have time for this, but I, I always offer like, Hey, here's my edit. Let me know if you want to jump on a call and talk it through. Right. Um, cause sometimes this feedback is just better delivered that way. Um, but then as I sort of work with them more and develop a rapport, you know, that's where I could get even like a little bit more jokey, a little bit more sarcastic. And, but there's a, there's a shorthand there. Um, in this case, like I said, I think I did maybe, you know, I don't know this, <laughs> this is an anonymous author to me. So, uh, you know, I wasn't that gentle, but also they, they, they declared war, war on me. So, so. yeah. <laughs> they started it. They started it exactly. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I can be kind of snarky when it comes to certain edits. Like one of the, there are a handful of words that you know show up all the time, and it's like ensure yeah. is my yeah. biggest one. And once I start seeing it, and I call it out the first one or two times, then I'll just start leaving like angry face emojis, <laughs> and you know, I, I start picking on people. But it's 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 out of love. They know it's out of love, and. Uh, very often they know that that's what they're getting into because you signpost that as an editor. And yeah, uh, Emily yeah. Epstein from uh, Asana, she, was, she used to be at Asana, she was on the show uh, a little while ago and she said, editor's gonna edit, that's it. That's it, that's it, yeah, that's what we do. And, and yeah, that's a job, but also like, I, I encourage people to see it as honoring, honoring the work um, because I've, I'm sure we've all had this uh, experience especially in a content marketing B2B context where you submit a draft and the editor is like, Oh, good to go. Nothing. And I'm like, really, did you read it? Like, I promise you there was feedback and you know, there's ways for this to be improved, but to me, it just shows that they're not engaging in it. So I would rather an editor engage in the piece and be a little bit, you know, up in my grill than then just be like, yeah, looks good. Publish which happens all too often, as we all know. Yeah, and it, it's, it's, it makes the relationship feel transactional rather than, um, rather than actually both people being engaged and invested in what they're trying to produce together. It's, it's, it's easy to get on the hamster wheel if uh, that you end up in that spot. I would love to hear from the audience your experience with um, your editors and... Uh, and if you've had an editor specifically that has pushed you to get better. Uh, cool. All right, so we can go through a lot of this, but I'd like to see, are there any places in here where they really stood out to you that you'd like to talk about a little bit more? Um, this one right here is kind of the one that's standing out to me is, it took a while for you to get here. Will readers stick around? That, that's it. Um, you know, I, I think every, every sentence, every paragraph um, should propel the reader forward. Um, and, and it's interesting because they give that own, they're, they're like, that's their advice when it comes to subheads. And I, and I completely agree. And I think their advice is really great, right? The subheads are meant to engage the reader and have them keep reading. Um, and so, you know, I, I sort of encourage them to, to you know, see that, to, to look at their own piece and say, hey, um, is, is what I've delivered here so far, is it propelling the reader forward or is it just sort of filler um, that is gonna stop them in their tracks? It took a while for us to get here. Um, we often don't finish reading the article that brought them 
to your blog in the first place. If it took us a while to get there, there's a little bit of irony to that to that uh, it. comment itself. That that's it. That's it. That's why I was having a little fun, poking a little fun at, at this writer because like giving them a taste of their own medicine. Um, but uh, because I, I think their I think their advice is really good, which is that you know every word should propel the reader forward. Subheads. Their job is to have people keep reading to pique their interest so they could keep reading. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, I, I would argue that that's not just about the subheads. That's really every, every line, every paragraph of, of a piece. Yeah. Uh, okay. So let's move forward. What are some other ones that maybe stood out to you, uh, here? Cause we've got another comment here. You find this condescending, um, <laughs> that endless stream of traffic you've been dreaming of. Yeah, like I, I find that there's some sort of superlatives like that. Um, and I can't tell. Sometimes it feels like they're just being sort of cheeky for the sake of it. Um, but I don't know, like, and, and are, are, are your writers reading this because they dream of this endless stream of traffic? Um, yeah, I, to me, that just it just felt like a little bit, a little bit condescending. Um, let's, let's, let, let's folk like there, there's really good advice for this piece. And it's really, it's about them. It's about the reading experience. Actually, it's not even about traffic. Um, so why are you sort of bringing in, like making assumptions that like, is it all, like, ultimately all you really care about is traffic. Right. Um, it's like, maybe, maybe not. Um, there are some blogs that aren't looking for mass amounts of traffic. They're very targeted at certain, right. Certain audiences. Um, so it just, it felt like a throw away line to me, whether it was condescending, whether it was deliberately cheeky, it felt like a throwaway. Um, and again, it just felt like it detracted from the point of the piece, which is really about the writing and, um, and that, you know, that fundament, like there are so many little bits of wisdom in here that are really, really good that the lines like that, just like, again, they kind of put me on the defensive as a reader. Um, and they make, they make me not <laughs> want to keep reading. Um, and so I, I also had like a you know piece of advice here where there's a section on examples, like examples of really good subheads. Tommy, I noticed that you were you were one of the examples, um, uh, and uh, uh, and and then there's like the four ingredients of killer subheads that sort of broke down what was so good about those examples. Like to me, that's sort of the the, the piece, you know. Like you have you have this framework, you have this formula, you have these sort of four ingredients: curiosity, surprise, personality, emotion. You have these examples showing your points, right? Yeah, you might want to lead in, in, in it with a hook. It might be a personal, you know, anecdote. It might be something else. But like, you're trying to do too much. Uh, and and actually, if you look up at the title of, of the piece, um, which I believe was like the ultimate guide to something, right? Yeah, it's like, I mean, you said this was an older piece, so maybe I'll, I'll give them a pass. But like, I feel like the age of the the ultimate guide is sort of over um, because we're realizing people don't want an ultimate guide. They want to like learn something very specific and come away with like a very clear takeaway. So you have, <laughs> that's right. Exactly. Maybe the penultimate guide, but never the ultimate guide. Sorry, dad, dad joke. Um, uh, so, so, um, so yeah. So again, like, um, you know, and I, I deliver this, this like, Again, I'm trying to honor the work here because I think it is good work. I think that you have some really good nuggets of wisdom. You have some really good examples backing it up. You have a really good framework. Then you're throwing in all these sort of throwaway lines and war metaphors. And then at the end, you start talking about like Lamborghinis and I'm like, what? Like, like all of a sudden it's like you're in a rap video. Like it's, it's just, it's, it's like distracting and again, like kind of off-putting. So, um, you know, that, that, that's the crux of my, of my edit here. One of the things that I've always yeah. tried to Are we still um, on? let people know up front too is don't insult the reader's intelligence, right? Like Sorry, go ahead. it's it's one of That's those right. things right. where it's yeah. really easy. And I, I saw this especially years ago, not so much now, but it's really easy to think, oh, because I'm writing about this thing, I know it and you don't. Right. And That's it's right. like that you, you, you run this really, um, you know, really fine line to be picking on it and i you know full disclosure too like we've done that on the show we uh, there was one episode where we ended up re-recording the ending because we were mean like really okay. mean to the piece so um it, and, and we don't talk about that episode anymore but um but you don't want to condescend your reader you don't want to because 
because they do have something that they're coming into this with. Um, there is always going to be a background and there's always, you know, a baseline intelligence and we have to just insult or not insult. We have to insult the baseline intelligence. No, we have to respect yeah. the baseline yeah. intelligence that somebody might be coming into this with and saying, maybe they just need a little bit of help, but not like I'm better than you, which something like this might subtly imply. That's it. That's it. Yeah. 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 And I, I hope we're, you know, we're not being mean to the piece here. I, I hope, you know, all this feedback is in the spirit of, of kind of honoring it. Um, and honoring the, the sort of intention of it. But I agree. I think, yeah, I think some of that sort of that writing is not is not helpful. It's distracting and, it, and it's off-putting. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's ultimately what we want to try to do is just, we don't have to write for everybody. That's not always the, like, that's not the thing, but it's also like, let's not, let's not make fun of the reader. And, and striking that balance, like that's the craft, right? Because like, you know, you might say to us, but you're always saying like, you have to be like, you want to be opinionated, right? And, and sometimes being polarizing is good because, you know, you're, you're just attracting the readers that you want to attract. And like, you, you want to provoke strong emotions, right? Because it gets people to keep reading. So like, and all of that's true as well, right? So I think it, it, it's, 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 it's the, the craft is in finding the balance. Um, and it's, it's one of these things where, you kind of know it when you when you see it or when you read it um and i think that if you know we go came away here being like uh i don't know if they quite nailed the balance here yeah um okay so we're actually close to the end of the episode are there are there major things because i really liked a lot of the examples that they brought out here right so uh tell your mother to go to hell that's an interesting subheader um the conversation that saved my life that's me um I forgot I forgot about this piece altogether. <laughs> yeah. So so what's what's the overall like is there anything else you would want to talk about in here or the overall sort of advice that you would want to give to this author as it relates to this piece? Yeah, I mean, I would say that there's there's some great advice in here. Um, you know, you know, but but the tone, you know, is maybe not accomplishing what you're what you're trying to accomplish. Um, so I would say you know, the strongest part of the parts of the, that post for my example are really those those examples um, and the formula that you give to sort of explain why those examples are good. Focus in on that. Um, strip away the filler, strip away the war metaphors, strip away the Lamborghini. Um, and uh, and you actually have yourself a really strong post. Um, so like often that's what it is, right? It, it's like, my, you know, Michael, the whole thing about Michelangelo, like he, he basically like would find a sculpture in the in the the block of stone or you know, I butchered that one, but um, that's what editing is, right? Like often like the piece is already there. You're just chiseling away all the extra words and all the all the filler and all the jargon. Um, so it's right before you. And that's that's that beautiful relationship between a writer and an editor, where like the editor's not doing the writer's job, but the editor's helping the writer a sort of um, platonic ideal of the posts that they've already written. And from a strategic storytelling point of view, um, that's one of those things where how are you doing that at scale across multiple pieces to tell a much broader story of what it is that you're really trying to do there? Um, well, I think that's it. That's our time. Uh, Dan, I could do this all day long. Um, Same. But, but we do have to wrap it up. Uh, it, has, it is that time. Uh, I would love to have another conversation with you at some point, maybe behind the scenes, or we can have a gated conversation if our audience is interested in having a private conversation. Uh, that would be super cool. Um, mm -hmm. But here we go. We're going to wrap it up here. Uh, I'm going to go straight back to my mind right here. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. If you liked this episode, please be sure to give it uh, a nice like, a thumbs up on, uh, on YouTube. We also just released the podcast edition of the show, so there are five episodes live there now. You can find that on Spotify and iTunes. And if you want access to this document and other documents that have been edited on the show, go to thecontentstudio.com forward slash the vault, and you can get access to a wide variety of our different editors' pieces to get a sense of what that's like in the document. And finally, 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 thank you so much to Hrefs for being our sponsor hrefs.com forward slash awt 
go ahead and download that. Don't download that now because it's absolutely free and you get a lot of very valuable insights out of that. Thanks so much, everyone, and hope you have a great rest of the day. Thanks so much for watching. If you liked that episode, please leave a comment and a like down below. And if you want to be notified about future episodes, please go to thecontentstudio.com forward slash the cutting room, enter your email address. You'll also get replays and other exclusive bonuses. Thanks again, and we'll see you in the next one.